All right, good. We're going to have a Bible class now on 2 Samuel. We're going to be studying that for the next three months. And uh, this will be kind of a follow-up. We did 1 Samuel about oh, six months ago. So um, just remember everything that we talked about six months ago and you'll be prepared for the class. That'll be... Uh, you know, we, we all have that kind of recall, right? Uh, for what it's worth, I can't remember what we talked about six months ago. I have to go back and read the notes. So, um, But... Uh, and in fact, uh, in some ways, that gap is bad because uh, we need to appreciate the fact that First and Second Samuel were originally one book. Uh, the Hebrew Bible does not have First and Second Samuel; it just has Samuel, and so they were originally one book. Furthermore, uh, the Septuagint has it in two books, but it's not First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. In the Septuagint, it's First, Second, Third, and Fourth Rangs, which suggests that we're really looking at four parts of what was originally one very, very long work about the history of Israel's monarchy. Uh, now, what kind of, um, when we're talking about the book of Samuel, the other thing we need to appreciate, you know, our English Bibles, they have the law, and they have the history, and they have the poetry, and they have the prophets. The Hebrews, they had the law, the prophets, and something called the writings. And they considered their historical books to be books of the prophets. You know, I think that that's helpful for us to remember. Because sometimes we think, oh, well, a prophet was a guy that tells the future to people and predicts what's going to happen next. Well, is that really a good definition of a prophet? No. What is a prophet? Oh, God. One who speaks is the mouth of God. One who speaks God's words. He is not a foreteller, per se. He is a forth. Now, sometimes speaking the mouth of God involves predicting the future because God knows what's going to happen in the future. But sometimes speaking the oracles of God means we're speaking about the past. And so it should come as no great shock to us that the prophets were the authors of Israel's history as well as of its uh, predictive substance as well. Uh, so when we read the books of Joshua and Judges, Samuel and Kings... We are reading the prophets. We're reading the prophetic interpretation of history. Uh, now, who wrote the book of Samuel? Remember? We had a little discussion about this, you know, six months ago or nine months ago or whatever. Anybody remember what we, what we said? Well... Did Samuel write the book of Samuel? That's a question that sometimes comes up. Hmm? No one's going to venture... <laughs> what? No, he didn't. What? Well, no, what, what? Yes. Yeah, Samuel sort of dies in the middle of the book, and uh, I don't know how many dead people are uh, known for their writing ability, but Samuel dies in 1 Samuel 25 and verse 1. So, unless he wrote everything that happened after his death, you know, by the span of about 40 years worth of material, which I think that is highly unlikely, um, you know, I'm not going to deny the Holy Spirit could have dictated that stuff beforehand, but... You know, we can't confuse what God can do with what He does do. And that, I think, is the real issue here. Um, there's no evidence anywhere that, Bible ever that the Bible had the biblical authors write out historical accounts as if they had already happened before they happened. Uh, you know, the Bible sometimes speaks of historical events before they happen, but it's always an indication. There's always some indication in the text that they speak of the future. Uh, there's a passage in 1 Chronicles 29, in verse 29, where it says that uh, the acts of King David from first to last are written in the chronicles of Samuel the seer, in the chronicles of Nathan the prophet, and in the chronicles of Gad the seer. Which suggests that not only did Samuel do some writing, but also Nathan did some writing, and also Gad did some writing. Now whether those three things are the book of Samuel as we know it, or whether um, you know, that's something else, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. But it is, I mean, you know, there's a bunch of prophetic writings, the point is, that we don't have those books with the names of the prophets on them, necessarily. Uh, that's what uh, Chronicles is suggesting here. What would you say the book of Samuel, First and Second Samuel, what would you say the whole book is about, in a nutshell? Hmm? 
Okay, it's about the kings of Israel, uh, and specifically, which kings? Saul. Mostly about Saul and uh, David. And actually, there's another major character, Samuel, that dominates the first seven chapters. So, we're looking at Samuel, the book of Samuel. The first seven chapters are devoted to the person who Samuel is. His birth, his life, his calling, and uh, all of the things that took place, uh, the, including the death of Eli and his sons, and the capture of the ark, and the return of the ark, and their eventual defeat of the Philistines. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, Israel comes and they say, Give us a king, so that we can be like all the nations. Now, I think the Bible's pretty clear about this, that God had it always intended for Israel to have a king, because there's numerous promises of it in the Law of Moses. You know, and not just that one passage in Deuteronomy. We're talking about Genesis 49. We're talking about um, Numbers 24. There's a lot of places in the Bible where God promises a king to Israel. But Israel's motive in asking for a king was definitely wrong. They didn't want a king because God had promised it. They wanted a king so they could be like the nations. They wanted to be like everybody else. That's the real problem there. And so... What we have in 1 Samuel 8 through 15, really, is the choice of Saul. And let me ask you something. Did Saul have any good, point, any good things about his reign? Are there any good things about the reign of Saul? Hmm? He put out the mediums, okay, mostly. Yeah? He strengthened the king of Israel, well, the kingdom of Israel, yeah. Uh, 1 Samuel 11, he defeats the Ammonites, uh, rallies the nation together and defeats the Ammonites. I think that that's a success story on that end. Now, did Saul's reign stay successful? Well, no. What happened? Oh. Uh, well, that was the Amalekites, but yeah. Uh, 1 Samuel 15, Saul did not obey the Lord. 1 Samuel 13, Saul did not obey the Lord. Saul has a problem with obedience. And twice in the narrative, in 1 Samuel 13 and in 1 Samuel 15, Samuel tells Saul that the Lord has rejected you from being king and he has sought out someone else to replace you who is better than you are. In 1 Samuel 13, he says he has sought out a man after his own heart. And in 1 Samuel 15, he says the Lord has torn the kingdom away from you and given it to your neighbor who is better than you. Enter David. I just realized I spelled it Daid, which is wrong. Uh, it's David. <laughs> David. Um, and what we have in 1 Samuel 16 is the anointing of David. This starts a conflict between the house of Saul and the house of David. A conflict. When does that conflict end? After the death of Saul, yeah. David is not king over all Israel when Saul dies. Really, this conflict extends all the way into 2 Samuel chapter 4 with the death of Ishbosheth. And even after that, you still see things, interactions with the house of Saul that are taking place. Um, but there's a conflict between the house of David and the house of Saul, which eventually gives way to David's Saul reign over Israel. And that's in 2 Samuel 5 through 24. David's sole rule over the nation of Israel. Uh, so I have included in the book that I booklet that I handed out kind of an outline. Uh, this general outline is the one that I used last time. I'm using this time. Um, I also broke it down a little bit into these uh, different sections, all these uh, inverse parallel structures which I wish I could claim credit for them, but most of them I have to give credit to a uh, uh, work called The Literary Structure of the Old Testament, who uh, very good about finding all this stuff. Uh, sometimes I modify it if I don't think it's very parallel enough. But um, what we're looking at, effectively, is in 2 Samuel, we're looking at basically the reign of King David, hence the title of the workbook. Um, now, next time, we'll talk about 2 Samuel 1 and uh, the following sections. And I'd encourage you to read Samuel, not just the first chapter, but read as much of the book as you can, and kind of think about the questions a little bit. Um, let me tell you.
me, let me ask another question. When we're talking about the reign of King David, what are some things, and this is just kind of a see how much we know, uh, see how much we're, how much, well, this is kind of an icebreaker to see how much we're familiar with coming into this. What do we know happened during the reign of King David? List some things you remember. Okay. Okay, so we have some kindness to Saul's house. Okay, good. And that's in 2 Samuel 9. Good, what else? Then, he wanted to build a temple. Yeah. Did he build a temple? No. He did not build a temple. That's what we get in 2 Samuel 7. Okay, good. What else? Okay, all right. So we had some trouble with our children, didn't we? All right. All right, so characterizing. Not everything David did was positive. And really, that kind of dominates the narrative everywhere from 13 to 19. Woo! But fulfilled Yeah, that's good. That's another thing that's crucial. Solomon finished it. Right, exactly. In 2 Samuel 8, we kind of have this thing where he's not only conquering the lands, but actually reaching out and taking other lands and subjugating surrounding neighboring nations to himself. Don. That's important as well. Um, you know, he's pre I'm going to put it off. It's not really so much an event, so much as a characteristic. But he inquired of God a lot. Yeah. That's, that's one of David's defining features in who he was. You know, you look at 2 Samuel chapter 2, for instance. Saul's just been killed. David knows what the Lord has promised concerning him. He knows what's about to happen next. And what does he do? Does he go immediately and try to seize the throne by force? No. He inquires of the Lord and says, what do I do next? And the Lord gives him instructions. You're going to start in Hebron. You're going to go to Hebron and they'll make you king there. Another really cool point, you get to 2 Samuel 5. There's a war with the Philistines. And David inquires of the Lord and says, what shall I do? And God says, you do this and this and this. And David does the Lord's strategy and they win the battle. The Philistines show up a second time, do the exact same thing, exact same location. It's like a mirror image battle. Now David could just repeat the Lord's strategy from before, but is that what he does? No! He inquires of the Lord again, and the Lord has a different strategy for him. It's important to inquire of the Lord. Sometimes the Lord doesn't give you the same instruction every time. You know, that's, what, that's what we see here. Uh, you know, wisdom requires handling different situations differently. So you know, inquiring of God is a huge characteristic of who David is, almost certainly. What else? I, I, I mean, well, also talking about conquering the land, I'd also be remiss not to mention the conquest of Jerusalem as well. Um, in one of the condemnations of Israel in Joshua 15 and in Judges chapter 1 is that they could not drive the Jebusites out of the city of Jerusalem. And so the Jebusites lived among Israel to this day. Well, in 2 Samuel 5, David kicks the Jebusites out of Jerusalem. He captures the city and he makes Jerusalem his capital. And so that's another major land promise thing that kind of gets tied up. The loose end from earlier that gets tied up in the story. What else? Oh yeah, that's true. He brought the ark to Jerusalem. Alright. Let's talk about that for a second. You know, we're bringing the ark to Jerusalem. Was the first attempt successful? Why did I even say first attempt if it wasn't, right? Uh, 
He tries to bring the ark to Jerusalem, and what happens? Hmm? You're not carrying it properly, right? You're not supposed to touch that thing. Uh, Uzzah had clearly never seen Indiana Jones, and he had clearly never read Numbers 3 and 4. He touched the ark, and the Lord struck him dead. Well, that, of course, creates a panic. Does David give up on bringing the ark to Jerusalem? No. What happens next? He well, yeah, he, uh, you know, but he prays to the Lord. The ark spends three months in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite, and then they take the ark and they move it to Jerusalem, this time the correct way, and there's great celebration and there's great rejoicing. Uh, so, I mean, you know, bringing the ark to Jerusalem, bringing God, the, the throne of God's presence to Jerusalem, is a major, it's a big deal in David's reign. So much so, that this event prompts this one. David realizes, I'm living here in this big fancy house of cedar, and the ark of God is dwelling in a tent. We've got we to do better than that, folks. Let's build a temple for the ark. And, well, and that is where the Lord's response comes to him. And really, if I think there's one chapter in the whole book of Samuel that is more important than any other, it's 2 Samuel chapter 7. Because 2 Samuel chapter 7 is where the Lord tells David about his plan. A plan that has far-reaching implications beyond the simple historical book. A plan to put David's descendant on the throne to build an enduring house for David. A plan that is ultimately realized through Jesus Christ. He says, I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. The Lord claims David's descendant as his own son. That's you know fulfilled in Solomon and fulfilled in other kings of Judah. But ultimately fulfilled in the Son of God, who was, all, who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh, but declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead, by the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 1, verses 3 and 4. So, 2 Samuel 7 is super, super, super important in uh, understanding everything that's going on, and kind of, in many ways, the centerpiece of the whole book. Uh, it's not structurally at the center, but it is, I think, the central point that we're really getting at. What are some other things that happened during David's reign? We've noted that David had problems with his children. Where does that start? Why does that start? Oh. Ah, okay. So before we have problems with our children, we have uh, adultery with uh, Bathsheba. And uh, there's a lot we can say about that. In fact, the bulk of the book of 2 Samuel is fallout from that one event. You know, just a couple of hours of wrongdoing changed David's life forever. There's a lesson in that too. The sword will never depart from your house. Almost everything that goes wrong after that point can be chalked up to what the Lord says. That the Lord will... You know, the sword will never depart from your house. The Lord will, you know, do this thing in front of all the nations of Israel. You committed adultery in secret. The Lord's going to give your wives to your enemies in public forum. That happens. You know, in 2 Samuel chapter 16, Absalom takes David's concubines out onto the roof and sleeps with them in the sight of all Israel. They pitch a tent, you know, and, you know, it's done technically under the tent, but everybody knows what's going on there. It's a political move. The bulk of 2 Samuel 13 through 19 is devoted to the revolt of David's son Absalom, uh, who, in all his good looks and his Gaston-like charm, he's uh, you know he decides he wants to be king, and that's uh, that's there's a lot in Absalom. What do we know about Absalom? Huh? He had long hair. We're told a lot about his appearance, right? We're not told much about, you know, the other stuff. But we're told quite a bit about what he looks like. Does that remind us of anybody? Saul. And we're supposed to think of Saul when we read about Absalom. Because Absalom gets the kingship very much the same way Saul does. No defect in me. From head to toe. Look at me. 
Now, Saul, Absalom also, of course, uses political manipulation and uh, you know, false campaign promises and all that other stuff. You know, he clearly was uh, the forerunner of many, many, many modern day politicians, I'm sure. Uh, oh, no matter, Absalom never met a plaintiff that he disagreed with. I'll just say that. Uh, it's quite impressive. So all that, Absalom was his third son, David, right, David's firstborn son was Amnon, he was killed by Absalom. His secondborn son is, depending on whether you're reading Chronicles or Samuel, it's, uh, it's Kiliab or Daniel, uh, the name differs from count to count. We're told nothing about him and a lot of people speculate that he died at a young age. I have no idea, I wouldn't know the answer to that. Uh, Absalom was his third son and there's because there's no mention of Daniel Kiliab anywhere, it's highly suspected that you know, the removal of Amnon would make Absalom the logical choice for the next king, being the oldest survivor. Of course, Absalom's out of the way, then Adonijah is the fourth son, who he makes his bid for power in 2 Kings 1 and 2. There's a bunch of other sons that David has. I don't think Solomon, Solomon's not very high. Solomon's like number 10 or something on the list of sons that David has. David has quite a few sons. Um, I was going to include a family tree in this workbook, and I couldn't get it to print right, so uh, I apologize for that. Maybe at some point I'll create a class handout and we can look at that in more detail. I've always thought that absolute killing of Amnon, raping Absalom, Absalom's little sister Tamar, probably. <laughs> I, just, I just always wondered. Yeah. If he really didn't have an ulterior motive. Right. Right. I mean, you know, I think the law of Moses you know, teaches in general that the, the penalty for violating a, a woman in the way that he violates Tamar is definitely death, according to Deuteronomy 22, 25 through 27. Um, some people have disputed that, and I've written like a hundred and something odd pages refuting that dispute. But if you ever want to read the most boring book ever written, you can ask me about it. But it's uh, <laughs> all that to say. Um, the, I mean, there, there's definitely a sense in which, yes, Absalom is more interested in Absalom than in, you know, helping others or exacting justice. It's sort of like uh, how Abner quotes scripture. Abner quotes scripture a few times, but he only does it when it supports a pro-Abner move. You know. Speaking of Abner, what's going on in the first part of 2 Samuel? We talked about that a little bit. Before any of all this other stuff, when David becomes king, what has to happen first? Oh. All right. So we got this thing with Abner. Uh, now is Abner the king? Right. So he's not the king. Uh, the king is a man named Ishbosheth. Nice thing to name your kid. It means man of shame. Uh, we'll talk about that when we get to it. But uh, now is Ishbosheth. Ishbosheth's the king in name. Is he really the king? Eh. Uh, who's really in? Yeah. Well, I mean, really, you get the impression from reading the text that Ab Abner is the real power behind the throne, and Ishbosheth is kind of the, you know, the puppet, the figurehead, or whatnot. Of course, there's this conflict, this war between the house of Saul and the house of David, and that is described in Second Samuel. 1 through 4. Uh, that's what that whole conflict is about up there. It involves eventually Abner and Ishbosheth have a falling out. Abner decides to defect to David. And then he becomes part of David's court and everybody lives happily ever after, right? Oh. Oh. So Joab doesn't like Abner very much, does he? What does he do? Oh, he kills him. Okay, so uh, that wasn't very nice. Now, again, done under the Joab's actions of killing are done under the pretext of avenging his brother Asahel. Sounds kind of like Absalom avenging his sister Tamar. But it's a rather convenient pro-Joab move because, you know, Abner could be easily perceived as a political rival. Um, what else do we know about Joab? What kind of person? Joab, 2 Samuel tells us an awful lot about Joab. Yeah. There is one thing about that. You can't be certain. It certainly looks like it was. But Joab was very 
very much on things like mm -hmm. most of his life. Yes. It, it could be that Joab you know, suspected Abner of being purely political and that he could sell David out the same way he sold out. It's a possibility that Joab you know, did that to protect David. I don't think it's super likely, but I'm not going to say that. Uh, let's talk about Joab for a minute. Because no. I think Joab had his own. Let's talk about Joab for a minute. Joab never tries to overthrow David directly. He's, you know, there's nothing, there's no question that he, you know, he, profet he kills anybody who opposes David. Is Joab actually loyal to David? He calls him Lord. Huh? Joab is loyal to Joab. You know, there's a frequent tendency that Joab has. Every time David tells him to do something, well, Joab only obeys it if he feels like it. You know, Joab is very much, I'm going to do things my way or else. I mean, so even though Joab, you know, claims he's fiercely loyal to David and he backs it up by killing a bunch of people that, you know, are not David, you'll notice a couple of other things too. Like when David replaces him as commander in 2 Samuel 20 with Amasa. One of the first Joab's reactions to that is to kill Amasa and take his position back. Does that sound like a man who's loyal to David? Or does it sound like a man who's loyal to his position and himself, ultimately? You know, David instructs everybody, don't kill Absalom. Well, and maybe killing Absalom really is the smart move. But Joab doesn't disregards orders regardless. He, you know, stabs Joab three times and buries him under a pit of rocks. And, you know, Absalom had it coming to him, but... You still can't get around the fact that Joab doesn't really think very highly of David's instructions when he feels like he should be doing it another way. So you have this kind of this thing going on where Joab is on one hand professing loyalty to the king, but on the other hand he's not really obedient to the king. He says, Lord, Lord, but he does not do what the king says. Now there's no parallel to that anywhere else in the Bible, is there? Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say. Luke chapter 6, Matthew chapter 7. Not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, Joab was very good at saying, Lord, Lord. I'm not so sure he was good at doing the will of the king who he was supposed to be calling his Lord. And so that, that's kind of the... That's kind of my nutshell evaluation of Joab. We'll, we'll go through the Bible text and you can decide for yourself if that's fair. Uh, but Joab definitely has a, he has a long streak of not doing what David says. Furthermore, the final thing that is said about Joab in Scripture is also telling. In 2 Kings, not 2 Kings, 1 Kings. Um, as David is dying, uh, David gives instructions to his son Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 2 in verse 5. He says, You know what Joab, the son of Zeruiah, did to me, what he did to the two commanders of the armies of Israel, to Abner, the son of Ner, and to Amasa, the son of Jether, whom he killed. He also shed the blood of war in peace, and he put the blood of war on his belt, about his waist, and on his sandals under his feet. So act according to your wisdom, and do not let his gray hair go down to Sheol in peace. Again, later on in the same chapter, uh, the king, uh, King Solomon says in verse 31, Do as he has spoken and fall upon him and bury him, that you may remove from me and my father's house the blood which Joab shed without cause. The Lord will return his blood on his own head, because he fell upon two men more righteous and better than he, and killed them with the sword, while my father David did not know it. Abner, the son of Ner, commander of the army of Israel, and Amasa, the son of Jether, commander of the army of Judah. So shall their blood return on the head of Joab and on the head of his descendants forever. But to David and his descendants and his house and his throne, may there be peace from the Lord forever. And so Abner, well, Abner is not evaluated well by David or Solomon at the end, and I suspect that has a lot to do with, well, I think it's an accurate evaluation, ultimately. Um, one thing I think is also interesting is that David never blames Joab for the death of Absalom. He blames him for the death of these two military commanders who were both hostile to him. Um, that's another interesting point to consider as well. Okay, and uh, let's see. We, we've covered most of the material. There's one other event, major event, I think, that's still not up here. Hmm? 
Well, no. Adultery of Bathsheba. Okay, yeah. What we're looking at is the last thing in the book talks about. The numbering of the people. The senseless census. Uh. <coughs> yeah. Now, we'll talk a bit more in detail about what was wrong with that when we get to it. But it's, uh, there's something obviously wrong with it because of all people, who opposes the census? Joab! Even Joab knows it's wrong. It's kind of this biblical text thing, but David insists, no, you go on with it anyway. You number the people. And this results in a plague that falls on the people, and this results in a huge catastrophe and disaster. And finally, David says, you know, I have sinned. The Lord instructs him to offer a sacrifice. And what I think is the most, again, a very telling statement about David's character appears in 2 Samuel chapter 24. Um, whenever they are, uh, you know, he's offering the sacrifice. He buys a plot of land from around the Jebusite, Mount Moriah, and uh, he calls him to, uh, well, he, he wants to buy the oxen from him, Arana saying, oh, no, 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 you can take the oxen. Well, David going to accept a gift like that? Shall not offer the Lord that Shall not offer to burnt offerings to the Lord my God, which cost me nothing. No. That actually harks back to the Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, that's one chapter earlier. I think we're supposed to see that parallel. That's really good. Um, it's a, uh, you know, David, you know, he's not going to take, well, he's not going to sacrifice what costs him nothing. He's not going to take what costs people everything. It's the idea being put here. And the Lord, of course, when he builds the altar, he offers the sacrifice. The last thing Samuel says is the Lord was moved by prayer for the land and the plague was held back from Israel. That's the end of Samuel. You know, we can continue reading into Kings and see David was old. But Samuel doesn't tell us any more about that particular incident or that particular place or any of the stuff that went on there. What do you know about the mount of uh, the mountain where David offered this sacrifice? It became the site of the temple. How do we know that? Where does the Bible tell us that David prepared all those materials? It, yeah, it's in Chronicles. It's not in Samuel, it's in Chronicles. Which gets us to another issue, and I've included a handout on this uh, in the uh, workbook. It's a few pages in. Uh, the parallels between Samuel and Chronicles. Now, if you read Samuel Kings, and you read Chronicles, notice that those two books got a lot in common. But there's a lot that's different between them, too, as we've got... Uh, you know, a bunch of different parallel gospel accounts. We have some parallel histories of Israel, too. Now, one approach to that is to, you know, take all the pieces of it and harmonize them together and tell a composite history of Israel. Uh, that's not what we're going to do in this class. Uh, I think there's value in a, you know, a united kingdom study and a divided kingdom study. But in this class, we'll be covering the book of Samuel, and perhaps at another date, we'll come back and get Chronicles. Uh, we'll note some similarities and differences as we go along. Um, but if you look at this chart, the book of Chronicles, what do you notice is the big, what are some of the big differences you notice between Samuel and Chronicles? Are there any differences? <laughs> I'm sorry? Okay, Chronicles says nothing about Bathsheba. Doesn't say anything about David's sin with Bathsheba. Doesn't say anything about Nathan confronting David after the fact. Doesn't say anything about David's child dying. Yes, Jed? Doesn't say anything about Amnon's rape of Tamar. Or any of the fallout from that, for that matter. Is Absalom in Chronicles? Hmm? 
No, Absalom is not in Chronicles. Uh, unless you count you know, the fact that his name appears in a genealogy list. Uh, but the story of Absalom is not in Chronicles. None of that revolt. It, pretty much everything from chapters 13 to 20, not in Chronicles. And, uh, you know, the whole... There's another element, though, that's... To, anything connected with David's sin with Bathsheba and its fallout is missing. There's another thing that's missing, too. Jen. Not exactly. Not exactly. Uh, you know, that's the temptation, of course, to view Chronicles as kind of whitewashing David's rang. All right. There's something else missing from Chronicles, too. Look up at look near the beginning. Okay, pretty much everything having to do with David's post Saul conflict is gone. Uh, there is nothing in second second nothing. I mean, second first Chronicles jumps right from the death of Saul to the anointing of David, and you know that's that's all there is. There's no mention of the fact that he had a war with Ishbosheth for several years. No mention of Abner. No mention of him punishing the Amalekite for Saul's death. No mention of any of that type of stuff. Furthermore, virtually anything that is connected with the house of Saul is cut out of the picture, which means Second Samuel nine, David's kindness to Mephibosheth, Saul's descendant. Not in Chronicles. That's a good thing that David did that Chronicles leaves out. 2 Samuel 21, where uh, they need to avenge the Gibeonites because of Saul's uh, attacks on them. Not in Chronicles, because it has to do with the house of Saul. Uh, the only thing Chronicles tells us about the house of Saul, you know, it's just a few passing comments here and there, is that he died, and that the Lord you know, killed him because he consulted a medium. And secondly, that... They didn't consult the ark in the days of Saul. Uh, that, that's mentioned in uh, the movement of the ark itself in 1 Chronicles 15. Oh, 15? No, 13, sorry. Um, on the other hand, Chronicles... Well, I mean, if Chronicles is leaving all this stuff out, why, would, why in the world would anybody study Chronicles? What does Chronicles have to offer? History, what history is, does it have that Samuel doesn't? Hmm? Okay, there's a lot of genealogies in Chronicles. The first nine chapters are dominated by them. Good. What else? What? Yes, Jen? There's a lot of information about the temple. A lot of information about the temple that is not in Samuel. Pretty much everything in chapters 22 through 29, like the whole last segment of the book, is about where we're going to build the temple, what we're going to put into it, who's going to work in it, how we're going to pay for it, and who's going to build it. Chronicles is chock full of that stuff. In 1 Chronicles 22-29, all information that follows David's census but is missing from Samuel. I'm, I'm sorry? Yes, they do. They expand on the bringing of the ark to Jerusalem. And they have 1 Chronicles 16, they have a special thing where the ark is placed in a tent. They have a whole other song that is sung on that occasion. They have the appointment of worship leaders. That's extra information. So Chronicles tends to take things out of the... It tends to leave out information about, you know, the conflict with Saul and the, uh, you know, the sins of David and all the things... Anything that would suggest that David wasn't in control of his kingdom. But it tends to add a lot of things about the construction of the temple. It suggests that there is a different emphasis that is going on between Samuel and between Chronicles. That emphasis continues into the differences between Kings and Second Chronicles as well. Uh, so those are just kind of things to keep in mind. But it is from First Chronicles chapter 22 that we learn that the mountain where David offers atonement for the census is the same mountain where they build the temple. In First Chronicles 22, uh, David built the altar to the Lord and that, verse 26, uh, 1 Chronicles 21, verse 26, it says, David built an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. He called to the Lord, and he answered him with fire from heaven on the altar of burnt offering. 
That wasn't in Samuel. The Lord commanded the angel, he put his sword back in its sheath. At that time, when David saw what the Lord had answered him from the threshing floor of Onan the Jebusite, he offered sacrifice there. For the tabernacle of the Lord, which Moses had made in the wilderness, and the altar of burnt offering, were in the high place at Gibeon at that time. But David could not go before it to inquire of God, for he was terrified by the sword of the angel of the Lord. Then David said, This is the house of the Lord, God, and this is the altar of burnt offering for Israel. This is the spot where we're going to build the temple, in other words. And at that point, you know, David begins gathering materials and constructing things to build the temple on that location. So the connection between uh, the mountain where David offers sacrifice and the uh, offering and the construction of the temple is established in Chronicles. Uh, those are just some different things to consider. We're not going to be going into in depth into Chronicles, but I want to be aware and mindful of the parallels as we go throughout. Yes, Mark. One other. Mount Moriah, yes. Uh, they, Abraham, Isaac, mm -hmm. that Lord was saved at that point. That place, killing the, killing the Israelites. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think that, that there's. Uh, I, I thank you for bringing that up. Um, I had forgotten to bring that up. But yeah, there's good reason to believe that Mount Moriah where Abraham offered Isaac, is also the same mountain on which they're building this temple as well. So uh, that's another good thing to consider. All right, for next time, uh, we're going to try to get through 2 Samuel chapter 1. Uh, the questions have been provided in the workbook, and I got you all the questions in advance this time instead of handing them out piecemeal. Uh, so you feel free to work ahead or um, continue studying. And um, just... Come prepared to discuss 2 Samuel. Thank you.